we have lost 75% of the world's seed diversity. If this extinction continues, our fields will look more like this. One crop, vulnerable to climate change, disaster, and disease. How can we protect seeds, seemingly small but valuable entities to our food systems and ecosystems? The answer lies in how people and seeds relate to each other and move with each other, which brought me, the daughter of a Danish immigrant, back to my cultural roots in the Nordic region. Now I bring you stories of hope from all across the Scandinavian region, the farmers, the scientists, the educators, and the activists who are changing the world one seed at a time. Just south of Copenhagen, Denmark, lies an idyllic farm with wheat fields, wild elderflowers, and a river encircling vegetable plots planted with regenerative techniques. Zoe and her husband Nikolai care for the land and the seeds grown at Brinkholm, one of Denmark's first organic farms. Hi, <laughs> so my original name is Ishul. By Raktar, but it's a little bit hard to pronounce in Danish, so that's why I changed it to Zoe. So my name is Zoe. Uh, I'm from Turkey. I was born and raised in Istanbul. Uh, then I met my husband, which is Danish. And one day in 2017, uh, we moved here to Penkorn. Penkorn is one of the first organic farms in Denmark, and we grow vegetables and herbs and flowers. It all originates from the seeds. Like the seed is very metaphorical in in many senses, but in a physical sense, when you hold a tiny little seed in your hand, even though they look so small, they are so precious and they are so heavy in value. They are so small, but they are also so big. And then all the seed wants is to be multiplied and to travel around, you know, um, because the seeds, um, the only thing they cannot do is to travel. <laughs> so that's why us humans and the animals, we are the ones, you know, we are the co-workers, we have to carry those seeds around. For generations, people have carried seeds with them, though with declining biodiversity, some communities have resolved to carry them all the way up to the Arctic Circle. In a land with more polar bears than people lies the Svalbard Gene Vault, a concrete structure built into the permafrost of a mountain, holding over one million seed varieties from nearly every country in the world. My name is Osman Ostal. I'm working as the Seed Vault Coordinator, employed at the Nordic Genetic Resource Center. Gene banks have lost their seeds due to flooding, the fires, lack of electricity, uh, lack of staff to look after the seeds and produce new seeds when, when that was needed, uh, in addition to war and conflicts in many places. So there are a whole range of gene banks that already lost their seeds. Uh, so if they deposit seeds in the seed vault, backup copies there, they will not lose the genetic resources. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault holds seeds and genetic information. But where are the gardeners, the farmers, and the cooks? Those who have the cultural knowledge to bring the seed to life. Many living collections like, uh, like seed banks, uh, but also uh, tissue cultures and also botanic gardens where we are now. There are collections of living plants. And a lot of the data that we connect to these living plants is basically very limited. It's the species, it has a number, 
It often has a location from where it was found, but there's no information often on how to use it, uh, how to grow it. There's, the people have so much knowledge about that sort of thing uh, that, we, that we just don't keep track of along with these collections. And also uh, local names and, uh, and how to use it. How do I eat this plant, right? We should be better at doing that. We cannot make massive collections of plant material without providing future users with a manual. Coalitions of seed savers, like the Danish seed savers, work to keep cultural knowledge and genetic material alive. I'm Louisa Winfeld. I am a horticulturist and a science writer. And uh, I have a PhD concerning um, how we communicate what we call plant genetic resources to ordinary people. And this led me to the Danish Seed Savers. The Danish Seed Savers were, is an organization, it's an NGO. And the name, the Danish Seed Savers, of course in Danish it's Frø Samlerne, uh, meaning the seed collectors actually. The Danish Seed Savers began in 1987 cultivating diverse heirloom varieties in their gardens. They exchange varieties with other seed savers, which encourages biodiversity. And then they got a letter from the Danish ministry saying, you're saving seeds, you're swapping seeds. That's illegal. For years, uh, there is an EU seed legislation and there is room in this legislation for um, an interpretation in all countries uh, that is actually different from country to country. And the Danish is the most liberal. All these varieties and everything you see here is not on EU seed list. So, being at the seed list you have to be DUS, which is you have to be distinct uniform and stable and everything here is not. That means that they are genetically uneven. They might produce plants that are not totally alike because the genetic material in them is different. That is how land races or heirloom varieties are. Throughout my time in Denmark, Norway and Sweden, I learned that heirloom seed varieties and those who protect them are diverse, unique, and special. One unique solution to protect seed diversity involved a farmer growing fields of many different varieties all together. First, my name is Per Gruppe, and I'm a farmer, and now I'm also a miller. I'm more miller than farmer right now. And we are standing in our rye field, and this will be our own variety. This will be a combination of, I think, about 20 different lines that we have put together. So there will be a population. And we are placed in the northern part of Zealand when we have only 30 kilometers from Copenhagen from here. And the funny story about rye, this it will, will be cross-pollinated, so it will pollinate. It can change, for instance, if when climate change, maybe we hope this also could follow the climate and still be the, not the same, because this is crossing and it will make new lines all the time. But we think that, we hope that this will make a good quality still. And if not, we have to do something. Mm. Yeah, we are happy about it with the people we have at the mill and we have also the great pleasure that some young people from who is in or they could be chef or they could be bakers they have been interesting to 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 follow our work and that's great Seed savers are diverse. 
young people are taking charge to increase the diversity of people that are engaged in seeds, food, and agriculture. Grant Markel is a farmer's market in Copenhagen that offers a welcoming community space for people of diverse backgrounds to learn and meet folks who grow food around them. My name's Rich. Um, I come from the UK, but I'm living here in Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, I'm one of the organizers of the Grant Markel, which is a farmer's market organization that started in 2019. Um, it's me and a few friends who all work in the food industry were quite surprised that there were no uh, farmers, local farmers markets in the city, so we started one and now it's grown into something quite big. And we had been wanting to for a long time to do a seed exchange where we would just invite the local farmers to bring seeds uh, and then also anyone who was coming to the market. Copenhagen is, like you say, a very multinational, multicultural city. So now we have all kinds of seeds from all, from all over the world, uh, lots of wheat varieties, uh, ancient wheat varieties. Denmark is quite well known for for its, yeah, it's the ability to grow wheat here, but it's always been very monocultural, so it's really good to see that there's a lot of interest in, in uh, diversifying wheat cultures. Um, just the stand next to me here um, is a, he's the savior of the Danish potato. He, um, it was the country in the world with the most potatoes. I think seven, 70 years ago, it had the most varieties of potato, and now it has the least, maybe like four, I think, left. Um, because all the potato farming turns to monoculture, so um, they thought it was best just to get rid of any diversity. And Leon, one of the producers of the market, he's slowly trying to change that. So he gets seeds from the Nordic Seed Bank and he breeds them up and up and up until they're a size you can sell. And we just had a French woman walking past and she said, oh, I saw your seed exchange. Would you like some vitalots, um potatoes, which are these bright blue potatoes from France? And he was like, oh yeah, sure, yeah, I would love some. And just, I tell you what, I just got some small Colombian potatoes from a friend I have in Colombia, and they're, they're, they're the highest starch content ever. You can basically thicken the soup with them if you boil them in. And he was like, I can't wait to try and grow them. So who knows, maybe we'll have Colombian and French varieties growing in Denmark before long. As people move, they bring seeds along with them, growing foods and medicines in new places to build a home and community. University of Copenhagen's postdoctoral researcher, Therese Gagnon, looks at the intersection of migration and seeds. You know, there's definitely things to make us concerned. I think globally we're seeing, you know, this continued retrenchment of um, xenophobia and nationalism, which is, of course, um, so prevalent and disturbing. But at the same time, I think that there's some really exciting counters to that and once again people getting creative and um, thinking carefully about how we can maybe subvert some of these structures. So um, when it comes to seeds and plants, I see that as people being, you know, possibly more open to a diversity of seeds and plants in their areas. I think that Certainly we can see seed security on one level, which is a vault, and I think that kind of seed security does have its role and its place, but also um, something that Virginia Nazaria has mentioned a lot and that I'm definitely um, interested in following in her footsteps in this regard is the aspect of this kind of like warm conservation or how people retain their connections and um, all the knowledge and relationships with seeds and plants that's necessary to really continue cultivating those things. So if, if seeds are stored in, um, in gene banks, um, the, you know, the physical seed is there, but is the knowledge and the ability to cultivate them and to use them there? And I think that's a huge dimension. So, when we see you know, seed security or food security playing out on a really grassroots level, it does look like networks of people who are able to you know, maybe um, send seeds or food from home and ways that people can access what they're looking for through those kin or um, other social networks. And there's also a lot of knowledge that's shared through those networks about how to cultivate things, including you know, maybe things that come from a different area. A farm in Oslo, Norway offers an opportunity to engage with both diverse seed and people communities, 
creating a welcoming space for community meals, knowledge sharing, and collaborative gardening. Maria is one of the volunteer leaders and shares how diverse seeds bring together diverse people. I think Law Settage is a very multicultural place. People have heard about it and then they can come. I mean, people from all over the world um, have got a connection to land and to earth and to plants. And so it's a matter of reaching them and so that they know what, where, where they can have that. Um, I feel very at home with these seed savers because there's just a lot of common sense and it's also I guess because of this whole climate change thing and just that they have this beautiful network. Already when I came to Lusette there was you know a section which was you know put aside for saving seeds and Kivan was already active here um, yeah. so it was very easy for us to start to just take, take some of the seeds of the plants that we wanted to uh, to share or to keep. Seed savers come in many different forms, from the seed vault guardians and botanical garden curators to the home garden activists, farmers market volunteers, and urban farm growers. The Nordic Genetic Resource Center does a little bit of everything in a very special way. Yeah, my name is Lise Lekke Stephenson and I am the executive director of Nordgen. Nordgen is the Nordic Genetic Resources Center and it's a knowledge center about genetic resources and it's also a plant gene bank. Our mission is to safeguard genetic diversity and also to bring it into use. Um, so not just only conservation, but it's also the utilization of genetic resources. Sending out more than 10,000 seed samples a year for universities, uh, companies, uh, museums and other who are working with the, with the seeds and the genetic resources. We, we also have checked a lot of, of the old varieties from the Nordic Gene Bank. And we, possibly if you contact them, you can get a, a spoonful of, for instance, Gotland's wheat. Uh, and, and you can grow it. But there will be something with uh, old varieties that will have... A, of course it's possible to, they can be growing here, no problem. But they have a lot of diseases, many, many people maybe think that a whole variety will have no diseases, but they have a lot of diseases, but they will still yield. Of course, it will not be a very high yield, but they can, they can survive with a little bit of diseases. It doesn't matter. It's not so important that it will be 100% resistant for diseases. What we store here are seeds that comes with a history something which is important for our cultural heritage and, and our understanding of our culture and who we are. And our mission is very important because we are, uh, we are both the past, the history and present situation now, but we're very much also the future. So the solution is to store these genetic resources in gene banks. But we could, uh, as consumers, demand more diversity in, in the markets, in, in the shops. We could ask for different varieties of, of tomatoes, vegetables, and, uh, and by that support farmers that want to produce different types of, uh, of the crops and, uh, and uh, not support those who, who just want to produce a very narrow uh, selection of uh, varieties uh, in the, what we can call a more industrial agriculture. So, so that's uh, quite a quite concrete thing that uh, we all could, could, could do.
Yeah, so in Denmark we have a very strong supermarket culture and the consumer the, mostly gets their product from, from the supermarket because the supermarkets provide everything you need. Like You don't have to go to the farm to buy, you don't have to go to a farmer's market to buy. You can buy everything that you, you need, vegetables, everything locally grown, organic, everything is there. Because the supermarket has been very like active on that part, meeting the demand of the consumer, so they provide both like imported goods and, and fruits, but they also provide local Danish produce. Um, usually from bigger farmers, of course, it's it's not the small scale farmers because they usually cannot compromise their prices to, to meet the supermarket demands. And there are a lot of people becoming aware of that a potato is not just a potato, a carrot is not just a carrot, or whatever produce is not just that produce. There's a story behind it, and there's a care for the for the land where it has been grown and the nature around, around where it has been grown. So there is a increasing awareness in buying stuff from small scale farmers that can manage the relation between nature and production, nature and culture, um, more balanced. Uh, more harmonious. The main threat that plants are facing is, um, well, it's a combination of land use and climate change. And knowing how to grow them and how to use them and actually actively using plants in daily life, not running to the supermarket for getting vegetables, but knowing what is growing around you or in the forest behind your house, that sort of generates a uh, a connection with nature that, that we really badly need. One of the things we often do when we, when we meet new school classes or visitors in the garden is asking people like, okay, which plants did you use today? And then you get like areas like, oh, well, I didn't use any plants. And then slowly it's like, oh, but you had breakfast, you were sitting at a table, oh, you were sleeping in the cotton bed sheets, oh, you were wearing jeans, or oh, maybe you had some aspirin. And like, it's suddenly the plants are actually there. <laughs> um, and, and to open people's eyes for that, I think we can uh, we uh, we have a really central role as a botanic garden because there's a plant, there's a story behind almost every plant that you see. Yeah, I think seed diversity and food diversity is the really exciting bit because um, it's awesome. It's like you get to play. I think that you know when we ask these questions about how to best um, do conservation or to preserve diversity, the answers are good things like we need to embrace taste and um, experiment with different flavors and of course there can be issues of class and access and barriers because a lot of times you know the places where these diverse foods are found are often hard hard for everyone to access but I think that um, it's not it's not impossible there's so many ways that we can consistently create systems that are embracing diversity and so it's really about the desire to get curious about what kinds of tastes and flavors and varieties are out there and figure out how to incorporate those. To, to summarize that is the seed actually is the very manifestation of life and then we have to take it precious and serious because without the seeds there's no life, we can't eat anything, you know? I mean. That, that's the thing. The seed is the thing. So, and a very important thing. <laughs> if you're interested in that, please. Yes. You are? Yes, I'm ready. Right. I'm right. oh, okay. okay. So, you start the day. In cultivating diverse and resilient societies, we need to understand our own seed stories and discover how we're connected at this very small yet important level.